Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, apologies for late start. We're into the part of the crossover process where things start to back up. Um, but with that said, uh, Emily, want to start us off? So just a reminder for people in the room, what we're doing is our strike hall version of H39. And we took a look at this language yesterday, had some brief discussion. So now what I have planned is mostly today and tomorrow witnesses um, speaking to not only this language, but to their situations in their communities, need for a delay, need not for a delay. Um, I, will, I will put it out there not as a universal prohibition, but just something to think about. We're, we're really not re-examining whether Act 46 should have been passed. So um, if people are here to testify, it's not going to be productive if that's how you use all your time. So the question really is, how will we move forward from where we are today, given not just what the judge ruled uh, a little while ago, but also what the House passed prior to that? So with that said, Haley. Yeah, so Emily Simmons, General Counsel, Agency of Education. If I could preview how I think you expected the agency to use our time, and then you can tell me if I'm sure. wrong. I have some short testimony substantively on the idea in your strike ball. I've brought along some guidance that the agency put out this past Friday that you referenced yesterday, and then I brought Donna Russo Savage, our specialist on the text of the laws around Act 46, who has some suggestions for your bill that you're looking at. Yeah. Um, and she can also follow up with your ledge counsel at your discretion. All right? Absolutely. So um, I'm here to express the agency's support for proceeding with Act 46 timelines as they are written in current law. Um, this is primarily on, upon reflection following the court's denial of the preliminary injunction motion in the litigation that you referenced, um, and also upon examining the needs and abilities to move forward of the relevant systems, those that are subject to the state board's final report and order under Act 46, which is dated November 28, 2018. And there are essentially four reasons that sort of bleed into each other why the agency feels that a delay is inappropriate at this time. So the first one is the um, clarity that has been afforded to the sort of field of, um, or the state of the law after the court's decision. So that decision denying the preliminary injunction prompted the agency to sort of afresh reach out to the districts that are subject to the state board's order to assist them in complying with existing law as it stands. Um, so I've attached our March 8th guidance, which was our first broad communication to the field following that court decision. It um, answers some questions that came up as a result of the first round of organizational meetings. It clarifies the role of the transitional board, which is the board under the state board's default articles that is in place by operation of the default articles in law before the election of the initial board. That terminology can be a little confusing, but it's the transitional board, that's the chair and the clerk by default of the forming districts. They warn the election primarily for the initial board. So um, I'm not gonna go through the guidance that's available on the agency's website and I've posted it with my testimony today. We can follow up if you have questions that come from reviewing that guidance. I'll just point out the last two pages lay out some timelines for the individual districts that are very specific to the events that have happened in each district. That's for informational purposes for the public and the district. They're not binding to the date on the districts. They can use their own judgment about the calendar, essentially. So like I said, as a result of the decision from the court, the agency is now in a better place to give good technical assistance to the districts on questions leading up to assuming full operations of the newly formed Union School Districts on July 1, 2019. Um, we're doing that in concert with the district's individual legal counsel and fielding questions as they come in. 
Um, it's clear to us after about a week uh, post decision that the major source of uncertainty for these districts is whether and to what extent the General Assembly will amend the timelines in Act 46. So just to put that out to you, <coughs> these conversations are now the big question mark for the district subject to the State Board's order. So second, um, if the General Assembly does amend the law in Section 566 of Title 16, which is the provision about what a district does if it doesn't have a budget on July 1, if you all were able to amend that and provide clarity, the district subject to the State Board's order would be in a far better place knowing that they could become operational July 1, 2019, barring foreseen or unforeseen delays on their path to full operations. Um, Wait, could you just repeat what yeah. you just said? What is, did you reference a section in the bill? Yes, your There's draft no of the bill does okay. um, does make changes to Section 566. Right now, the agency doesn't have a really firm opinion on what sort of flavor clarity on Section 566 should take. I think you'll come to that, and we'll continue to talk to you as you go through your process. The House has the 87%. Yeah, there's the various approaches you could take. Our strong position is that you should do something, whatever you're able to do, to make sure that the districts have a budget or um, an amount to borrow against on July 1, whatever the General Assembly's preference is. Um, we um, do anticipate that circumstances in one or more districts might prevent them from having a budget on July 1, but if um, there is time under law to take every step legally required between now and July 1 to assume full operations. So when we are stressing that we need a fix to 566, it's just assuming that something will happen along the way in at least one district. I think it's just prudent to assume that something will slow at least one district down. So if a correction or clarification were made depending on what you bought to 566, there, um, the district subject to the state board's order, I think, would feel a great sense of relief. There's fear because there is uncertainty around 566. If that could be addressed, I think it puts everyone in a uh, state of certainty around what's happening with Act 46. So third, the agency believes the state as a whole benefits most from moving forward with the timelines in current law. The potential harm presented by a longer transition period to full operations really outweighs the potential for benefits in a longer transition process. We remain concerned that community members, voters in new um, union school districts certainly don't have complete information. There's been a lot that's happened since November 30th in this realm. Um, and any, anyone may pursue strategies that delay the lawful transition processes. It's totally understandable. That's a um, state of being that will definitely exist until July 1, 2019. A delay uh, stretches that state of uncertainty out. Delay and confusion creates pressure on local officials who've already taken on a tremendous amount of stress and responsibility to implement Act 46. Um, I, we feel that it's unfair to ask those public officials to endure the hyper-politicized school governance climate for another year unless clear benefits to students can be identified. The agency has not identified clear benefits to students in a delay of one year. Um, additionally, there is um, concern that we have about potential for conflict of the roles and responsibilities of the initial board and the forming districts existing individual school boards. So to explain, while a newly formed district is in the process of transitioning to full operations, whether that's for the next four months or for a year and four months, there are two boards that have responsibility for the operation of the schools in those towns. Um, that authority can be overlapping and shared and can certainly create tension in those communities about big decisions. So the initial board, which is the board that would be elected for the first um, year of operation for the new district, is responsible for planning for that first year of operation and the future of the district. The existing forming districts boards are responsible for the district schools until that date of transition. You can, I'm sure, imagine all sorts of uh, big decisions that are important now and important for the next few years of the school district. I think the classic one is hiring a principal. 
who will have a contract for more than one year, we can assume. Um, we feel that decisions like this are ripe for conflict and confusion, and it is best to limit the time of conflict and conf confusion as much as possible for these districts. So just to clarify, and I think you just did, but I just want to rephrase it yeah. a little bit. So, so you're saying that whether, if we had no delays, there would be this period of time until July that is ripe for the kind of confusions you're talking about. You're just saying we should have that be a shorter period of time as possible. Okay. Um, I think the common phrase is rip the Band-Aid off. I'm not sure how much we all agree with that, but that's what I'm alluding to, that there is inherent conflict and confusion. I don't, um, the agency doesn't think that should be stretched out any further than it absolutely needs to be. Then finally, just in terms of operationalizing a delay, um, if you were and you are considering one, uh, upon looking at the options that have been put on the table, it's clear that neither an objective set of criteria that declares, um, as a matter of fact, which districts would get a delay, or allowing districts to choose for themselves whether to take a delay, none of those options are really appropriate policy mechanisms due to all the factors that I've just described. So to take an across-the-board delay first um, for all districts, that clearly would disadvantage districts that do wish to move ahead in 2019 with their unified system. And we know that there are such districts. Um, I'll cite. Just, just if you could unpack disadvantage, it disadvantages them. So if you were to um, delay all of the mergers in the state board's final order and report, and there would not be a choice to go forward in 2019. The agency believes that there's at least one set of districts that would prefer to go ahead in 2019. That option would be taken away in a across the board delay for everyone. So you're not referring to our language, but to a, a different way yeah. of doing it where everybody would have that. Yes. Okay. So that's an option that's been discussed. I think it has um, big problems. The second kind of delay, which is what the House passed, a delay based on objective criteria, could either be the criteria that the House um, described or new criteria earlier on in the conversation you were um, describing, Mr. Chair, sort of a, what I call the notice criteria. If a set of districts had been recommended for their um, current governance structures by the secretary and then the state board took a different path toward merger, yeah. at one point you were talking about delay for those people. Um, I think no matter which set of criteria you were to pick, there would be clear winners and losers. Um, all systems would not be satisfied, and I think it would be problematic in its own way, depending on the criteria. And then finally, the language that uh, you're considering is delay at the discretion of the initial board of school directors. This is problematic because um, that set of decisions sets up a contentious election right at the forefront from the initial board members. We could expect to see sort of single issue elections, if you will, where uh, voters are deciding between candidates who want a July 1, 2019 date and a July 1, 2020 date. There are obviously many other issues that the new district will need to consider, and I, I think that it would be a disservice to the district to have a hyper-politicized election right off the bat. Those initial board members will have three-year terms. Their terms will go on beyond this important initial decision. Secondly, your language sets up a very difficult decision for those same boards around um, sort of the incentive of keeping the small schools grant in perpetuity. That is a very contentious issue to throw into the middle of a board that are just learning how, hopefully, to work together to govern the schools. Can you explain that? What, what, what is the decision there? <coughs> so, in your language, if the initial board made the decision to choose a July 1, 2019 date, that would come along with a guarantee that any schools that currently receive a small schools grant because of size would continue to receive the small schools grant going forward with the operation of the new district. The sort of cost, if you will, of choosing a July 1, 2020 start date under your language or operation date is that you do not get the guarantee of your small schools grant in perpetuity. So in other words, there's two decisions that a district, that the initial board would have to make. Are they gonna, uh, it's one decision, but two components of it. Do they want to 
move forward to uh, make July 1, 2019, perhaps in order to get the small school grant piece in perpetuity, or do they want to delay? So I, what I hear you saying, Emily, is um, that we've got a, an initial board, and then they're presented immediately with uh, a complex decision that may be contentious in the community. Um, I get that, but I believe no matter how you do it, if let's say that we said the existing boards would determine the same things, um, I think it would still be contentious. So I, I don't, it, it seems to me six of one, half a dozen of the other, whether it's the existing boards or the initial board in terms of the contentiousness. But to me, the, the, the value added <coughs> with the initial boards is that everyone moves to that level where you now have a, uh, what, what AOE has been uh, sort of nudging communities to do, which is move down the track, have an organizational meeting, warn that, and then create the board. So on your timeline, what, what this bill does is about half of your timeline. Um, so the only difference is that they would have an extension, but they're still pursuing your, your timeline. They're pursuing the timeline created by the law. The agency yeah. didn't make up the timeline, to be clear. Um, and then they get to this very contentious decision. There will be very hard feelings on either side, no matter what the initial board decides. Um, I, the agency <coughs> feels that that is a toxic governance atmosphere and is uh, really problematic to give an initial board that has other challenges facing it but, without this decision. Okay, but toxic governance atmosphere if you take the current situation, you have some districts where they're going to hold uh, commingled votes, and that's creating lots of uh, animosity because communities feel like they're um, they're being subsumed in the larger vote. In other words, their their vote as a community isn't determinative; it's now a commingled vote. So I I think I, I hear you, but I think we're in a situation where Governance is snarled because we're in the last end game of this. We're attempting to replace one system with another. And so what, what I see this bill doing, the strike all, is moving people through a certain amount of it. Then admittedly, there's a delay and there's time for these feelings to linger. But there's also time to get it right and move more deliberately. Andrew, you to... Can you remind me what would happen so that they pick the 19, they, the bill gives them the small school grants in perpetuity. What happens if they do the 20, 20 date with the small school grants? I think Donna is going to be nudging you towards a little more clarity on this point, but we read the intent of your language to um, retain the current sort of um, two-prong criteria to get your small schools grant as a size eligible school, which is that you demonstrate under the state board's metrics that the school is operationally efficient, academically excellent, or so geographically isolated that it qualifies under those So you may criteria. still get it. You, you would still um, you have to apply, yeah. apply yeah. for it. Yeah. yeah, I've been asked to stop using the word. There's plenty of energy. money. Because in everyone, it. Could, everyone could get it. It's mm -hmm. not a competition. But it, it is a um, rigorous application, I'd say. And, and in terms of the excellence piece, your, your results would be analyzed each year along with your geography. Yes. In terms of the, your point about toxic government situation, it seems to me that in many communities that are grappling with this, there already seems to be a toxic governance situation. And that I think what the bill is attempting to do is to say, can move beyond that and start making progress toward um, this uh, probably probable inevitability, which is that you're probably going to have to merge based on um, the state board's ruling and based on what we know from the preliminary court ruling. But you can have a delay, but you have to sort of move along the path to making progress as defined in Act 46. Um, but if you're able to do that, then you can potentially get your small schools grant 
and you can get the delay. And you have to sort of cut through the toxicity to do that and work together. And there are communities that probably with this incentive for delay and getting their small schools grant can cut through that toxicity and get it done. Where there's so much toxicity that they can't get it done, it already exists. It's not created by this process. It's already been created by a whole host of factors, many of them at the local level, some of them at the state level. And so I, I don't see how this necessarily makes it any worse. And, and the situation in Stowe, which we heard about yesterday, um, I really was impressed. They had, as part of their legal understanding with the judge and, and with the state, they had agreed to a two-track process. So they were advancing um, plans to create their new board, create their new budget, as well as create and warn and pass budgets under their existing system. Now admittedly, that's a lot of, a lot of work, um, but we would be not asking for a formal arrangement with the judge, but rather the bill would just say, if you want the delay, this is how you get it. It doesn't mandate that they take a delay, and if people don't, under this bill, empanel that initial board and choose the delay, then your memo where you lay out how the agency will respond is still in play. So, in other words, if people are refusing to make progress just because they're not going to, then AOE is in the position that it's in now with regard to those districts. I think I, the proposition is just that these communities, um, to the extent that there's toxic governance that's not created by your language that exists already, um, asks them first to have a very difficult, we can assume, contentious debate and board vote about which course they will take, knowing the very high stakes of their decision either way. If the vote on the board, it's not really get through it, it's if they have the vote votes on the initial board to, to choose the July 1, 2020 date, we can assume another year of um, stagnant, toxic governance if that's what pre-existed the decision or was caused by the hard road to the decision that the groups of districts made. I don't think that's to anyone's benefit. And, and your point is well taken, and it's one we've had on the table since we started this discussion, which is if, if we decided we were, everybody was gonna bite the bullet, we were going to finish this by July 1, then on July 2nd, we'd all be in a much better place, theoretically. The question is, can it be done by July 1, uh, given the circumstances we've, we've heard and people's belief that they need more time to, as Stowe said, to do it right and build support in the community. So, um, so I don't think anybody's disputing the idea that in one way, it would make everybody's lives easier if this ended on July 1. The question is, is it, is it feasible and can we do it in the right way? Yeah, so it, for the feasibility question, I refer you to our guidance, which I said I, I wouldn't yeah. hit you over the head with. It's there if you want to read it. And in terms of the benefits that districts will find in the extra year if they take it, I'm sure you're going to hear lots of testimony after me and you can make your own judgment. Do you want to hear from Don on it? We always want to hear from Don. Okay. <laughs> I'll see the chair, Don. <coughs> Mark, you can take mine. Okay. So I have no, where's Andrew? Mm -hmm. I have a note you need to be out at 3.30. Is that correct? I can be late tonight. Okay. Well, um, we will do our best to make sure that. You know, I speak really quickly, so <laughs> it should work. I'm Donna Russo Savage. I'm a staff attorney at the Agency of Education and I focus on the governance um, issues. Um, I looked at draft 3.1, which you had yesterday, and then discovered that there was one that I think I, I saw that it was around noon. It's 4.1. 4.1. Which adds in something that was one of my concerns. So I, I looked through this with an eye to if, if I'm still at the agency and I'm trying to help districts implement this and understand it, what things do, would I need to know more about. Some of them may just be talking with your, gen, excuse me, with your, um, your legislative council about um, you know, what was intended, but others I'm not sure if you, you have discussed because I haven't been here, so I don't know if you've made the distinction or not. So as far as the operational um, 
date and the vote on the operational date. I see that the 4.1 added in a default date if no vote is taken, and that was one of my concerns. I think it still would be helpful perhaps to, it's implied by that by saying that if there's no vote or decision made, um, then the default is it will be operational on July 1, 2019. I think that that implies that the vote has to occur by July 1, 2019, but I think it might be helpful to make it more specific um, in the place where, where it says there should be a vote, just, just so that it's very clear to people this needs to be done by this date if, 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 it's, if you're going to um, go forward. Um, in the default articles section, there are some dates that need to be changed that were listed. I went through the default articles um, uh, again this morning and saw that there are other dates that should change, there are other dates that should not change, and then there are at least a few that I think you probably will make a policy decision on whether or not you want to change. And the one that came to um, my eyes first is um, that there are protections in here for small schools. Mm -hmm. And for example, that there are in the default articles, it says that for two year, two academic years, 1920 and 2021, um, you know, certain things can't be done to the building or the movement of children yeah. unless, unless it's agreed to. So it's really a policy decision of whether you want to extend that for another two years um, for the places that vote to go operational later, or if you want to keep that the same. I, so that, you know, that's, yeah. that's just something that you all would need to decide. Good point. I, I, I think, I don't want to speak for the committee, but certainly my intention would not be to um, curtail that period. So if we're saying to them, you can get a delay legally this way, then it seems to then me that those well. should push out. Um, can you share those, uh, sure. those dates, changes with Jim? Sure. Um, a, a third thing were in the small school grants, and this was just, it was a little bit um, unclear to me overall. Um, one of it was, is it was unclear to me, because I hadn't heard you discussing it, to which category you intended it would apply, and whether it would, it, it seemed quite clear to me that it would apply to the existing districts that were enlarged by putting in um, an additional district, because I saw reference to merging district in here, which, mm -hmm. which is, you know, is, is only for an existing district. Um, I think that it could be read potentially to imply to the MUDs if they're enlarged by the conditional vote that comes in with the, the merger. I, I didn't see the way that it was currently written that, but I wasn't sure that a newly, an entirely newly formed district would be able to um, have this, small, this, uh, this perennial small school grant. So just whatever it is you decide, I just think it needs to be really, really crystal clear, which it so is. So and my intention in drafting it was that they would all be covered all. so long as they come under that debt. Okay. Well, the, the MUDs automatically come under the deadline because you said they couldn't extend it. Yes. So that would... But... but if, if they have that vote by then. Right. If, if they yeah. don't hold a vote, then they don't. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, other, the other thing is that um, it was a... It was a and I think it's, I think I'm, re I'm trying to read this with the eyes of, of um, people in the community, trying to you know to see what would confuse me and what wouldn't confuse me. Um, I, I found the eligibility to be a little confusing. I wasn't sure which which criteria applied. Whether it's the criteria that um, that currently exists and under which they've received, um, or the, or the ones that start on July 1. So I think that just that area, to, to the extent that that can be clarified, that yeah. would be really helpful to me, certainly, trying to implement this. Um, the final thing is on the budget. Um, and there, there is, and I don't know what page it's on, on, on um, and, and what line it's on, on in draft 4.1. But it's, um, it, it was talking about the current fiscal year, relating something to the current fiscal year. And as I read it, I, I wasn't sure whether that meant this current fiscal year or the current fiscal year when they're trying to deal with it. And I think it's just something to talk about with, with your um, legislative council. I think it's just a clarity thing again. And then actually I, I went to Brad James to ask him could he read this, and did, or, or was I was I unclear just because of me? And he told me how he he thought it would be read, but then he also said that if if you talk about something that exists in a current year, you need to say on a particular date because it occurs at various times during the year. So I think that maybe if you could talk, to, I know that you've talked to him. And I think 
some, but I think if you could talk to, to Brad, who's the only person who understands how all this works, I think, um, about about the particulars, I think that that would help too. So it was kind of those, just those broad areas of bringing more clarity to what yeah. you intended, um, just so that we're not trying to figure out what it was you intended. No, I appreciate it. Um, but otherwise, I, you know, I thought it was very clear, very straightforward. Um, okay. It addresses everything that I think you intend to address. Perfect. Our questions for Don. Thank you very much, Don. You're welcome. Don and Emily, appreciate your help. Uh, Andrew. Uh, so I, I would say that there's probably no community in this entire process, we go back seven, eight years, probably no community that's been mentioned more often in this room than Huntington and uh, your, your board now, not Mansfield. Um, Is that good or bad? <laughs> I, I think it's good. I mean, um, you know, I, I'm a little partisan, but Mount Mansfield was one of the pioneers in what we were doing and showed the way, showed that there were savings to be had, opportunities to be had. Um, with that said, Huntington has been outspoken from the beginning about their desire to remain their own governance unit. Um, so we'll have testimony from Andrew, now chair of the Modified Union School District, and then tomorrow, we have testimony from someone from Huntington, so theoretically we'll get both sides. You, you didn't need to separate Paul and I, but that's fine. Okay. <laughs> uh, so my name's Andrew Pond, uh, and uh, thank you for that introduction. I currently chair the Mount Mansfield uh, School Board as well as the Chittenden East Supervisor Union School Board. Um, I submitted four pages of written testimony. I, I'd rather supply too much information uh, than not enough. Uh, but I've prepared some remarks, uh, kind of a summary of all that information. Um, I do want to thank you for the opportunity to testify on the question of extending the deadline. Um, as you probably know, the portion of the statewide plan relative to our region uh, concludes that the Secretary believes that the best means of meeting the Act 46 goals for both the district individually and for the region is for the State Board of Education to merge Huntington and the Mount Mansfield School District into a singles district by requesting that uh, Mount Mansfield accept Huntington as a full pre-K through 12 member. It's important to point out that uh, a lot of folks have described the State Board request that we accept our non-member elementary district uh, as, a, as MMU voting to fort, force Huntington to merge. MMU voting to force Huntington to merge has, has been uh, said a number of times. Um, so. Um, the, the first page of my uh, testimony includes a lot of governance history. Um, you know, in short, we had seven, uh, seven districts uh, and we combined uh, in 2015. The discussions actually began in early 2000s. Uh, we had uh, Jericho and Underhill had three schools um, in those two towns and they were trying to figure out how to deal with that and out of that they uh, recognized that unifying governance would make a lot of sense. Uh, so by 2014, our MUD was formed. 73% uh, of residents in the other four towns uh, favored uni unification, uh, while obviously one did not. Um, it is noteworthy that the Huntington School Board has never taken a position on merger or viable governance, and they say that their actions are taken simply based on the most votes of their electorate, uh, and that's frustrating uh, for the Mount Mansfield Board. They never had a vote? They have never taken a position on merger or governance as a board. Right. They, they have held votes in their community. They've held a number of votes in their yeah. community without the board taking any position. Got it. Yeah. yeah. And, and in fact, they've been quite adamant at some meetings that they were voting to allow the town to hold a vote, but that does not mean that we have an opinion on merger. It's been frustrating. Okay. Um, now, the third and fourth pages of my written testimony consist of two motions, uh, one from each of our school boards. And I included those because I think they illustrate not only the positions of our respective boards, but the enormous effort that has been involved just in managing the request in the state board order. Uh, of course, this, uh, the, the wording of that order brought Matt Mansfield into the suit that Huntington has filed against the uh, state board and the agency. 
So I know I'm out of order, but jumping back to kind of summarize the second page of, of my uh, memo, which is, I think, kind of the meat of what I'm here to talk about. Um, you know, we have 3% of the student population in Vermont is in Chittenden East. Uh, we are the only supervisory union remaining in Chittenden County. Um, Mount Mansfield 2,400 students are unduly disadvantaged by a governance structure that requires the superintendent to divide their efforts and attention for a separate district of 100 students. Large majority of citizens, the MMU board, the Agency of Education, the State Board of Education, and the legislature have all concluded that a unified union is the best means to achieve education goals. Now, the phases and pathways to preferred governance in Act 46 of 2015 uh, conclude with the State Board of Education issuing a statewide plan. Now, in 2018, it came to light that Act 46 did not delegate the authority to the State Board to merge MUDs like Mount Mansfield. I believe there are four others, uh, as, of course, the uh, law did for other governance structures. So in the best interest of education, of students, of efficiency and transparency, the State Board could only request these mergers. Uh, the legislature cannot have intended that citizens would vote to enforce the mergers that were ordered by the legislature and delegated to the State Board. The legislature must correct this oversight. Now I do want to say that the Mount Mansfield Board proactively embraces challenges. Um, with, the mer with the merger, we embraced, embraced policy governance. Shortly after that, we started a partial foreign language immersion program, which was the first of its kind in the state. This year, we've decided to repurpose a school building. Uh, none of those were easy decisions. But the state board order and the lawsuit brought by our non-member elementary district have consumed enormous amounts of time and energy that in no way benefits students. So the MMU board has not made a decision about the merger request from the State Board of Education. The only benefit that I could see from a delay uh, were if we were to wait until all legal challenges have been resolved, um, as this has been a big part of the discussion uh, that I hear is coming from, from Huntington. Which could be quite a while. It could be. In that, let's say the decision is made in June or July, um, you could have an appeal to the Supreme Court. I think that's the expectation. Yeah. Um, so with that sort of evolving situation for Mount Mansfield to even make a decision to hold a vote that would pit one part of our community against another, um, it may, might not be in the best interest of our community to even make that decision. So I, I hear you um, in terms of it's a strange situation that the, um, that the, um, the non-consenting district in, in, the, in the area um, was not, that the board wasn't given the authority to forcefully merge them at the end of the process. Um, but those particular situations like Huntington, that's why we created the modified, as you, you know, the modified union district law, the MUD possibility came about to address the Huntington situation and partially because we were changing the law to advantage the districts that disagreed with Huntington, I think there was some lingering sense somehow that we should, that we should allow them a little more determination uh, or that it was a different situation than in a non-modified uh, situation. Not defending it, I'm just pointing out that might have been how it came about. So, we are where we are. So we've been told by our legislative council that if you don't warn and win a vote by July 1st, that that conditional request from the state board goes away. And at that point going forward, the only way Huntington would be um, merged with you is voluntarily. Is, is that your understanding? That is our understanding, yeah. Okay, and that being your understanding, do you, what do you think the likelihood is that you would warn a vote before July 1st? It's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, I, I've been asking myself uh, ever since the board order came out, um, you know, how, would, how would we react? So there's a, a couple of different questions that the board's going to have to wrestle with. Uh, the first is uh, uh, you know, whether or not we hold the vote, uh, even though there is wide agreement that a unified union is the best way to run a school district, and we've long held that position. Uh, obviously, the other district has strongly been opposed. 
Um, and so there's, um, as, as one long-term resident put it to me, uh, we don't want the narrative for the next five decades to be that Mount Mansfield forced Huntington to merge. One other interesting piece of history that we were talking about when the mud merger happened is that when, um, when Mount Mansfield was originally built, it was just the four towns, uh, Richmond, Bolton, Underhill, and Jericho, and two years later, Huntington came along to join in. Uh, so we were hopeful that uh, shortly after we had merged, at some point things would change in Huntington, but they haven't. Um, you know, and, and we're concerned um, that given the emotion uh, that has come from a lot of school districts, and Huntington in particular, that if we were the entity that were to make the decision to hold this vote, uh, that there would be some animosity that, that I don't think rightly belongs with the school board. Uh, the next question then comes is if we do have a vote, um, and there, there isn't absolute clarity about whether or not the vote needs to be held in a town meeting style arena or whether it would be by Australian ballot. Um, I, I, personally, I think Australian ballot would be uh, more advantageous in some ways. Um, one of the concerns... Yes, yes. yes. Uh, one of the concerns, though, is uh, it sounds as though because of the way the law uh, the state board order is written and the way our articles of agreement are written that we'd have to have a town hall style meeting. Uh, there are concerns that uh, one town uh, who is the most emotionally involved uh, might send a lot more folks to that meeting and that might sway the results. So um, I hear you saying your number one ask is that uh -huh. the legislature should cor correct its mistake and uh, resolve this issue rather than leaving it to you. This issue should not be up to the Mount Mansfield Board, yeah. absolutely. I, I think it's fair to say, um, speaking for my committee, we're not going to be rewriting the math, which is, that would do, in effect. It would be us stepping in and saying, now that now it's not a conditional merger, it's a, it's a for, forceful merger. So I don't think we're going to be um, doing anything like that. If we don't do that, then uh, situation remains. And, and I guess the way I would put it is, I feel like after having looked over the five, now four, conditional merger situations, I feel as though those communities, fairly or unfairly, they, they have the tools to determine their own destiny. So, so if your board wanted to, and I understand there are complications, but if they wanted to, they could warn a vote and potentially win the vote or they could warn a vote and Huntington could potentially win the vote. So, so the, there's a, a single thing left to do and then that conditional merger is either in effect or it goes away. So you can delay, you can warn a vote and win or warn a vote and lose. Either way, those three options are in your hands. So to me, that's an argument that the legislature at this point should step back and in this bill, not address you. Um, what's your thought on that? It, given that we're not going to forcibly merge on the team. Right. And so you'll see in the uh, Matt Mansfield motion, motion that I included in the handout that our intention, um, if a merger is not successful, um, is to dissolve the supervisory union. Uh, there's an existing process. I don't think that it has been done very often. I expect that it will be messy and involve some very difficult discussions. Um, but I, to me, that that you know, there, there's a lot of a lot of ways that aren't very good out of this for the districts, uh, given the way the law was written, whether that was intentional or not. I, I find it hard to believe that the legislature actually intended for part of our community to be voting against another part. Um, I think we we always talked about it in terms of would you vote to accept the other community? In other words, this is an orphaned community. The metaphor was all hate and comfort. Um, but I, I think you're right. In, in practice, it looks like a hostile takeover. Um, this orphan doesn't want to be part of the family. Yes. I mean, that's and, and under this bill, uh, so we're going to have somebody in from Huntington, and what I will say to that person is, if I'm you and you don't want to merge, then my feeling is you should want to be excluded from this bill. In other words, why add another year where Mount Mansfield could conceivably um, vote to uh, 
want to accept you. So um, I, I think your supervisory union problem is something that we might be able to, to think about in another session other than this one because it's unusual and I agree you're you're roped in in the SU with a partner who is suing you and it's the only SU left in Chittenden County we should be able to figure a way out uh, for all parties we're facing crossover now and our, our plate is full just with the delay question so I guess that's my last question to you is um, having deliberately left you guys out of this um, do you want to make an argument to be put in for a year delay? I have to say it seems odd to me that, that with Act 46 intending to create unified unions that somehow through the language and the intention that uh, the legislature would have wanted us to end up in the situation that we're in uh, with an orphan district um, that has the ability to stay separate that forces the existing district uh, to continue being inefficient, not being able to focus on students, and, and to then be looking a number of years down the line uh, for some other sort of relief so that we can get back to focusing on students and get away from expending all of our energy on governance. Uh, I don't know that the, the deadline in Act 46, as it's currently written, um, is going to have a huge impact, whether it's July 1st of this year or next. Okay. Uh, thank you for that answer. Um, I would put it to you like this, just not in terms of logic or policy, because in this building, sometimes those are in another room, um, and sometimes they're in the room you're in. But in this case, if we were to add to this bill a piece that said, Huntington, notwithstanding uh, other legislation, will be forcibly merged, we would be writing an addendum to that map, and then it would be fair game, I would think, for anybody else to say, X community will not be forcibly merged because we're, we're in the game now of creating a new map. So I view my, my path for action without horrific unintended consequence as very narrow right now. Um, I think the supervisory union question is something that you can get relief through the state board. Um, and I hear you saying you don't have any strong desire to be put in this bill. So we're not alleviating your, your problem, but we're not making it worse. <coughs> Is that fair? <laughs> <laughs> you gave us a horrible situation, and now you're not making it any worse. And I'm not sure that, that Mount Mansfield and Huntington are, the, are unique. Uh, and I'm not as familiar with the other, uh, I believe it's four months, as I'm sure you are. One is resolved. Yeah, and so, uh, um, I mean, I wasn't suggesting that this legislation in any way be specific to our district, but it surprises me very much that Act 46 would end up in a situation where there were any districts for whom it was not determinate yeah. by the state, yeah. by the state order as delegated to the State Board of Education, exactly what was supposed to happen, uh, and instead it throws it back to the communities. We've had the tools to merge for decades. That obviously didn't work without the carrot and the stick or without yeah. somebody coming and saying it needs to happen. And that, that's, that's what the outcome we expected back 46 was yeah. for the state board and the agency to figure out the best way for things to be organized and for that to happen. I hear you. Um, this is the second time we've done a broad-based consolidation of districts. So if you go back 100 plus years ago, we had a couple of thousand districts. And they were you know, sometimes three to a town. So you'd have a tiny little town with three schools, each its own district. And at that point, there was consolidation. And it was, when you look at it now, it, and you look at it from uh, 30,000 feet, it seems like an amazing, efficient consolidation. But if you start looking at it, there are these little anomalies. And unfortunately, I think the Act 46 process will also produce anomalies, places that, in a, in a perfect world, a perfectly logical hand would have come in and said, to Huntington earlier than now, five years ago, we're going to write it so that you must merge in the final plan if the board says so. We didn't, so that may mean in our final map that Huntington, which is with the gray dots there, may remain its own district going forward 40 years. Here's my prediction. My prediction is if we leave you out of this, July 1st will come, and if you haven't warned a meeting, Huntington remains by itself, and their compulsion to merge goes away, 
I predict within three years they come to you with a proposal to merge. And is that best case scenario? No, but it it could conceivably happen because they are, I believe, looking at rather high increases in their property tax. At a nine and a half percent budget increase this year, they're running a hundred thousand dollar deficit uh, this year as well. Exactly, and they, they're not going to be able to sustain that unaided. I, that's my my feeling. So, I I wish that I could offer you two kinds of relief today, um, especially because, as I said, Mount Mansfield has been an amazing success story for the state in terms of being an early adopter of these kind of governance units. Um, and we've you know we have in the past written specific legislation to help your situation. I just don't see how we do it um, at this moment in time with this bill before us. Um, any other questions for Andrew? Can yeah. I just have a comment? Um, well, Andrew, thank you for your testimony and for all the work that you've done. Um, I am a former school board member who went through the Act 46 process. I've co-chaired my committee, and we always look to you to try to figure out what did they do first so we could figure out what to do. And so thank you for being a role model. Um, I hear that you're in an impossible situation. I represent Huntington, and I am trying to have their best interests at heart. Um, and um, I think that the law as it was set up was supposed to be a will you, um, will you take in the orphan, not will you, uh, 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 not will you, uh, uh, you know, overtake the, you know, it was supposed to be a, a comforting, not as Senator Bruce said. So, um, and it sounds like that's not going to happen in this situation, and there's no way that this committee will vote to force them to come to you. I wouldn't, um, I would not vote for that. Um, so I think that um, the, the way that it's written, we are trying to do the best thing we can for both of your situations, and um, just, you know, want to thank you for your work, and, and sorry that you're in the situation you're in, but it's, it is the way it is, and um, yeah. And it is <laughs> Good exactly 3.30. Yeah. Right. yeah so happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Andrew, I received two copies of yours. Okay. Andrew, thanks so much for coming in. No, I appreciate your, your listening, and, uh, and we'll, uh, yeah. we'll continue to do the best that we can and the, you know, the cards, with the cards we've been dealt. Okay. Thank thanks. you very much. Thank you. Alan Gilbert. Very nice to see you in the building. Thank you very much. Alan, I missed it. The days when you weighed in on every judiciary bill. <laughs> I missed them too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the record, uh, for the record, my name is Alan Gilbert. I'm a member of the Worcester School Board, and I'm here um, representing myself today. I I came up with this testimony. I'm yeah. sorry, can I just clarify? Um, so in other words, you're not representing your board with an official policy position? That's right. I can't do that because we haven't voted on whether this is an official doctrine from the board. And we're very, for any of a number of reasons, we're trying to be very <laughs> careful about that whenever any of us speak. Okay. But I will say that our board did vote to join the Athens litigation, so we are we are part of the litigation that's that's moving forward. So if that's a statement of the intent that we're trying to pursue at this point, that's the one with 33. Yeah, 33, 34, something yeah. like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I I I came up with this testimony largely to to get my own th thoughts going about this. I don't think I'm going to go through and read this. You can do that. Uh, the first paragraph is, is just who I am and um, why, how I've ended up in this situation of being back on my Worcester School Board. Um, I had been on school boards for 20 years before this, uh, local board, supervisory union board. I was the chair of the supervisory union board for a period. I was the president of the Vermont School Boards Association. Um, I was very active in Act 60 and equity work generally back in the 1990s and 2000s. That work led to uh, my working for the ACLU from 2004 until 2016. Uh, my district, when I was the chair of the Worcester School Board, 
became a plaintiff in the Brigham in the Brigham case, um, and working with the ACLU on that is what finally led me to to uh, take a job with them several years later. So that that's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing I wanted to say was paragraphs two, three, and four are really some history that I've run into because I'm 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 working on a book about equity, and I've tried to been I've I, I've tried to understand what is it about Vermont that from the very beginning of this state's history it's it set extraordinarily high goals for educating kids in this state. I mean we were the first state to have public education for all kids in the 1777 Constitution, the first one in the state. We talked about setting up primary schools. We talked about setting up grammar schools. It, we talked about setting up a university. And there was no other, I mean, we weren't even a state then. There were two states arguing over the wilderness that was Vermont and who really owned it. And yet the people who formed the state were already thinking that far ahead about how important it was to educate kids. So it, it was a really heavy lift that the Constitution put in place for all of us to continue working on. And I think over the years, you know, you, you read some examples I've given, um, it's been almost impossible to really, to really meet the goals that were set out in the original Constitution. And there have been a lot of arguments, there have been lawsuits, it's absolutely nothing abnormal about the way we've done education in this state for two centuries. So it, the hard work has been worthwhile, I think we have a great school system. But it has come with a lot of social capital that's, that's been needed to make it happen. And that, I think, is what school boards have been about for, for a good number of years. And one of my uh, biggest concerns about what's happening now is that uh, we do have a situation where, where things in some towns have become toxic. I think merger itself, just because of the decrease in the number of school boards means you're going to have fewer people who are communicators of a school's mission and the work that's done there than we have now. I think of building a, a sheetrock wall and, and if those of you who have ever done this remember when you do so you put a four by eight sheet of plywood you have studs behind it that are 16 inches off center and this would be like building that wall but with two of the studs missing in the very middle of the sheet of plywood. Because in, in our case, we're going to end up with about one-third the number of school board members at the end of the process than we have now. So you're going to have that many fewer communicators. That more than anything else is what really worries me about what I think is about to happen. On top of that worry is the worry of the divisiveness that the process has engendered in the five towns that my supervisory union makes up. So I got into, the, I was appointed to the Worcester School Board last May because there was a vacancy. I felt we should not be going uh, through the process without five members on a board. So I grabbed, I took the ticket, I got on the train, and I, I really have been as much an, obser an observer of this process as anything else. Um, and I've, because of the writing I've been trying to do, I'm also looking at this from a historical standpoint. And I am concerned of where we're at now and how we move forward. So I welcome the opportunity to figure out how can we make this happen and, and have the final outcome be as positive as, as anything. I, I wanted to point out one thing that I think is really important to remember. And that is the uh, third paragraph uh, from the bottom. Uh, where I say that there, the order that was issued November 3rd for merger of the six schools by July 1st was in the most favorable light viewed as a tough challenge to meet. And then the filing of the Athens litigation added a further layer of uncertainty. That uncertainty has not ended with the ruling that came from Judge Mello in um, the St. Albans Superior Court the other week. And the reason is that uh, it's true the Superior Court judge's initial ruling was against the plaintiffs. The same thing happened in the Brigham case. In the Brigham case, which was filed in 1995, the first, um, uh, first review of the case was in the Lamoille County Court in Hyde Park, and uh, the plaintiffs lost. And for any of a number of reasons, both sides agreed 
to an appeal to the Supreme Court, and that appeal uh, was heard about four months later, and then two months after that, there was the Brigham decision handed down by the Supreme Court in February of, of 1997. So just because there's been an initial ruling denying a stay of preliminary injunction doesn't necessarily mean that the legal questions have been addressed and they're over. They're not. The simple fact that that's still the case, whether we agree or, or don't agree on what the ultimate outcome we think is going to be, exists. And people in my town are concerned that there's still open litigation on this and it really would be better to delay this for a year until we work through the entire process. Would a year be enough? I don't know. But certainly in the Brigham case, the court showed when it had to, it can move very quickly, and it did, six months after the, after the initial ruling from the judge. So that's, I think that's something important to keep in mind. The other thing that I wanted to point to, uh, is, to is to tell you, as I think you know already, we're one of the towns that really is concerned about the debt issue about the assumption of debts. Um, and what I tried to do was to look at uh, a spreadsheet that the state filed as part of the Athens litigation to estimate the additional burden on Worcester taxpayers owning certain homes uh, to see what it would be over the course of the time we'd be paying the outstanding debt uh, from other towns. My town has no debt. Uh, there are, there's one other town in our, in our five town district that has, uh, I think it's 12 million, might be 10 million of outstanding debt that will go for another 10 years, I believe. Um, how is your deferred maintenance in your building? We have had a capital fund that for the last five years has kept pace with the maintenance items that had to be done. So, because I think one of the, not in every case, but in a lot of the cases, Sometimes you have towns side by side where one has accrued debt because right. they've been making upgrades to their buildings, right. and then sometimes in the other town you'll have low taxes, low debt, but a building that's in need of serious work. We had a we had an improvement uh, expansion project in the late 1990s, early 2000s, and that took care of a lot of stuff then. And I, I believe people have been keeping up with it since then because there is a capital fund that yep. has substantial money in it. Um, the estimates for what it's going to cost somebody who has a $100,000 home in Worcester is they have an additional tax burden of $69 every year, $2,000 home, $138, $300,000 home, $207. And I, I note that no prebate amounts uh, are reflected in these amounts because it's impossible to know how that, how that could work out. So these probably don't seem like large amounts to most people, but if you look at the profile of Worcester, the income levels there are not particularly high. And the second thing you have to realize about our town is that 51% of the land in the town is owned by the state or is held by, by uh, entities uh, for the public. So there can be no development on their land. I know that means nothing in terms of our ability to raise school taxes because it's a state uh, grand list we have now. But it means that when we as a town need to repave a road, the only tax base we have is from our town. So in fact, we have one of the few paved local roads in our town needs to be repaved. And at our town meeting this year, we spent a half an hour uh, trying to figure out how we were going to at least get a top coat of asphalt put down on that road because it, it, it is close to becoming impassable. Um, so, for us, something like forty or fifty thousand dollars a year, which is a very rough ballpark estimate of what the amount of money that's going to be leaving Worcester because of the debt issue, that's actually a fair amount of money for us, and it means something substantial to people in town. That has become an issue that unfortunately has heightened the division that was already building just because of merger. The debt issue. And, and if I could um, just jump in here. So I said to Mr. Pond that we wouldn't be rewriting the map. Um, I, I, I don't want to speak definitively for the committee, but I feel similarly about rewriting uh, Acts 46 or 49 in terms of the conditions under which people will merge, changing their default articles, 
So the way it stands now is that map behind us is the final order. There are default articles which are <coughs> in place. Um, so speaking to your debt problem or trying to help your debt problem is in effect taking sides in your disputes with your neighbors, which this bill is not going to do. Um, so if I could ask you to more clearly, does the debt issue bear on whether you want a delay or not? Or is it just a factor that's made it tough for you to merge to this point? I have my eyes set on what we look like and feel like two or three down, years down the road. So I think a delay for us is good no matter if the debt's there or not because it, this, the process has really been very, very fast for us. And the filing of the lawsuit and the general discussions that we've had in our towns have made it difficult for people to move in the kind of measured comfortable state that I think would lead to good decisions. I think if the debt issue could be addressed, it would help us to tamp down that divisiveness and have more rational conversations about moving forward. We're, we're not, if I may, yeah. we're not asking for a solution from the legislature on the debt issue. What we would like would be to be able to determine ourselves how we can possibly mitigate the effects of the assumption of debt. Which um, the judge pointed out in his 25-page ruling that communities have the ability to amend their articles of agreement with regard to debt. Um, so that that is possible. It might not be easy, um, but it is a tool that's available to you already under your default articles. We actually didn't. We're not sure the judge has that right, to tell you the truth. If, if, if I could walk out of this room feeling that the legislature has our back, if we tried to do that and came up with another solution, it would make me feel really well, good. Well, in terms of the legislature having your back, writing law to say that, uh, no. But I, I do see that the judge, in other words, nothing against your board. Yep. But if I have the Superior Court judge and his take on Acts 46 and 49 for your boards, especially since he's arguing what you want argued, uh, that's what I'm going to go with, which is he's saying the ability is there to amend with regard to assumption of debt. Um, so uh, there was one other thing you said that I want to talk about. You were talking about a delay. You said it would be good for your community. And then you said, would a year be enough? I don't know. And I, I, I really want to speak to that because this draft, as I've conceived it, makes it very clear that what's being offered here is a year delay in service of getting to the end of this process. And that doesn't include everybody being in the same place next year. So we have you in next year to talk about another year delay. That, um, from my discussions with Pro Tem, as well as um, with other people, no one wants that to happen next year. So. Um, I understand there are some communities who don't want to merge and would like endless delay. What this is offering is a delay in service, specifically a final delay in service of being done by July 1st of next year. So um, nobody can predict the future. Um, probably some people will come in and ask for a delay next year, but at least as regards me and, and this committee, I would be completely unwilling at that point to, to do anything along those lines. So any, anything else you can tell us, Alan, about um, the, the pieces of the bill that would affect your community? Have you had a chance to look this over? Yeah, I have. I yeah. don't think I've looked at the, there's a new version of the bill that came out at noon time. Yeah, very today. small pieces. Yeah. Okay. Really okay. just clarification. Okay, because I, 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 I didn't see that. Um, my understanding is that uh, when it comes to a delay, we would have an option to, if the new board voted on a delay, there could be a delay. Uh, if we were to do that, any chance of tapping the small schools grant would disappear because you have to make a decision to merge effectively as of July 1st of this year. Um, well, you could still, you would still be 
it in, would be guaranteed. In the process that the board, state board has laid out, you would still be able to apply for a small school grant each year, but you would have to go through that 16 point Right. Process. So even if we delay for a year, we'd still have the chance to, yes. to, to go, okay, well then I misunderstood that. Yeah, the, the, the real advantage to going July 1st, 19 in terms of the small school grant is you don't have to apply yeah. automatically. Right. I, you should know that one of the things in the lawsuit, you probably do know this, is that is there's a challenge to the small schools grants. Yeah. So it's <laughs> yeah, ironic for me to testify on, yes, we'd love to be able to tap that small schools grant when the lawsuit says we think they're inequitable. Um, but the, I, I do worry about having to vote for a merger, uh, partly for the reasons that I think Emily was describing, uh, or maybe it was, was Donna. The, these elections for who will be on the new board, I don't know how contentious they're going to be in our five towns, but if they become a referendum on whether you're in favor of voting, for, whether you're in favor of a delay in merging for a year or not, it's going to set back, it's going to set us back even further to getting beyond the point of contention that we're at now. I, I'm, I'm really, for me the important thing it is not necessarily merging, and I, I know from the legislative standpoint that's the goal. For me, the goal is being in a different place in somewhere between one and five years where we're collaborating more closely together as a school union, saving money, providing broader opportunities for kids. By school union, do you mean a unified district? Well, th th that's I think to us that's much less important than actually achieving the goals of efficiencies, lower costs, and broader opportunities for kids. That's what, that's what most of us in our district, and I know it's what I'm focused on. And I, I think the focus here, and most people's focus, has been on one step after another moving forward, getting to the change in governance, and then we've done it. I mean, that's only the beginning. And I want to make sure that once we've gotten past that beginning, we're actually going to be set up for success and not failure. One of the things that I would say across the board, from Act 46 to Act 49 to now, one of the things that has been universally true, when people impanel the study committee, those people might have been hostile to the idea of merging. Almost invariably, those study committees themselves, the committee, came after study to believe it would be a good thing. Communities that did merge, almost without exception, have decided that it was a good thing for them. So there's this period where people's perceptions are one thing until their governance shifts and they realize that it was an invisible line all along. Now there's a slightly larger invisible line and yes, a couple more people are on a board somewhere but now my kid has BAM, now my kid has AP courses, now my kid competes in sports where they couldn't before. There are real tangible benefits for parents, and that's what changes the attitudes. That and you know, communities that acted earlier got substantial tax benefits for doing so. Um, so it, it has not been a, a, a history so far of buyer's regret, right. buyer's remorse been more a history of people getting right up to the point where they would be able to see that and stop it. So I do want to, I want to make sure that we, I have a meeting at 4.30. Anything else you'd like to um, make sure you share with us now? Uh, no, I think I'm finished. Okay. I appreciate you coming. Thank you. Appreciate the time. Um, okay. Patrick Flood, please join us. Good afternoon. My name is Patrick Flood. I am the chair of the Woodbury Elementary School Board. We have between 45 and 50 students in a 100-year-old school that's actually in terrific shape um, and has no debt. Uh, I'm here very specifically to tell you that I really think we need a, a delay. Um, we've come to the conclusion we need to move forward with Act 46. I'm not going to talk about that at all. <laughs> you don't want me to get started. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, I want to talk about a delay, but I want to make a couple of points. And one of them is that we were surprised in the fall 
Uh, we were required to merge with Hardwick and with uh, Greensboro and Standard. That came as a surprise to us. We had been told as recently, I believe, as early in November, that we were not going to have to merge. Uh, when the preliminary report came out from the, the state board, it said, you're going to have to merge, and then the final report confirmed that. But the reason for that in our mind was we had met with Secretary Holcomb back in the summer. We had a great meeting with her. Uh, she was hearing from different schools that were impacted. We all went in from the whole supervisory union. Every school was, was there. We talked to her about what we were trying to accomplish voluntarily uh, in terms of integrating, in terms of sharing resources. We had some great ideas. She loved it. She didn't talk to us for 15 minutes. She talked to us for an hour. Uh, people were coming to the door saying, <laughs> and she kept talking to us because I think we convinced her we were all there, we were all together, and that, in my mind, is why she didn't require us to merge in her, excuse me, in her initial report. Uh, so we were taken significantly by surprise in November. We had not, we, there'd been a lot of, we had put together a Section 9 plan, there'd been a lot of work done, but we had not given the serious work to what really needs to be done if you're going to merge districts. Uh, we've started that work. I don't want to uh, tell you that we have not. We're trying. It's very complicated, uh, which I'm sure you know. Um, but just trying to deal with electing. the transitional vote? We have not. And here's an example of what we're up against. So we scheduled. This is just normal. This stuff happens. We had scheduled an organizational meeting for, I think, the, uh, gosh, the end of January. We, we did it incorrectly. The supervisory union did not use the correct number of days' notice. Somebody complained. We had to reschedule it. We scheduled it to the end of February. We had the meeting. People came in. It was well organized. And they uh, motioned for and got a recess until this Friday. So we've lost two and a half months. This is just normal politics. This stuff happens. But time is really running out, and that's my key message here. We're not trying to avoid the merger. Uh, we're going to try to make the best of it, even though we have lots of things to talk about. But uh, I just want to say to you folks that uh, I spent 29 years in state government. I was a commissioner of two departments. <coughs> I was the deputy secretary of AHS for four years. I was around during the what I considered to be ill-fated reorganization of AHS during the Douglas years in the early 2000s. We reorganized all of AHS. We took months. We spent millions of dollars. There's only one part of that reorganization left. The rest of it all fell apart. The part that's left is the department that I ran, which was Dale, because we did it right. And I, and I use those words still <laughs> early, Mr. Chairman, because that's what you said earlier. You talked about doing it right. And, and doing these kind of complex reorganizations is difficult. And it's not just about deadlines. Deadlines are really important right now. It's about relationships. And we are already encountering some of the burgeoning toxicity that, that you've heard about many, many times. And we want to manage that. As, as uh, prior speakers have said, you know, I don't, we don't want to live with this for the next five years. People are already deciding they're not going to be on the board in the future because it's too challenging. Yeah. Um, so I can keep this relatively short. We need more time to put together a budget. We haven't done that work. There's a draft budget. We haven't really, uh, the boards have not reviewed it. Uh, to elect a new board, you know, if you look at the rules in the, in the articles, you know, we have basically have to give six weeks notice uh, in order to have an election. It's not going to happen. It, you know, to do all that and have a board in place that then approves a budget, uh, to have that all happen in time, it's not going to happen. There's going to be a serious stumble. With, with that in mind, um, what this contemplates is a year delay. In order to get that, you form a transitional board, warn a meeting, and then elect an initial board. That board makes the decision. Do you have time to do that? Yes. Uh, we certainly have time for the, tr the transitional board. We're going to have the organizational meeting this Friday. I think the transitional board will probably be sworn in next week. Yep. We will sit down. We'll go start going over the budget. I think we, we absolutely have time to then warn a meeting uh, and, and 
elect uh, a new board. Now, just by exactly by when, I can't say. Yeah, but, um, but, but that would be up to you. But and and I've read in your bill, and I'm not, I don't think I've looked at the the most recent version, but I will. Um, and, and you have a provision in there that says that the new board would vote yay or nay on a delay. You know, personally, I think we can live with that. It's in a way, it's democracy at work too, right? Um, um, but that delay, it's not clear to me when that delay would actually be till. It's until July 1, 20. Okay, but if we completed things sooner, we Just could. have more time. Yeah, so, you know, as I say, the, the people in my, in the three towns, I, I can only speak for Woodbury. I'm not pretending to speak for Hardwick or Standard or Greensboro. So I don't think they'll come in here and say anything different, but who knows? Um, I think we can pull that off, but we need more time or it's going to be utter chaos. Yes. Okay. I appreciate your testimony very much. Um, and, and, you know, the, the thing that I always think is the most uh, hopeful when people come in is when they talk about wanting to, to get it right and wanting to um, fulfill what they perceive their obligations to be, whether they like them completely or not, um, and this is meant to be open-handed to those sorts of districts. If people are not willing to <coughs> take the steps to form an initial board, let's say, then they're on the path that they're on now. Um, but for people who are just looking for more time, who want to build community support, who want to reduce that level of lack of understanding in their communities, <coughs> I, I think it's a, it's a fair bar. I, I, th I do think in the bill right now, if I'm not mistaken, you have some hard deadlines around July 1st. Yes. Uh, I think it's going to be hard to accomplish all that at the same time. Uh, so, for example, the articles for us are, uh, I, I would say, contentious. You know, one town thinks this article needs to be changed, the other town thinks this one needs to be changed. And how we negotiate all that and then warn a meeting and get it, you know, that is going to take time. We're not, we don't have a draft set of articles yet to go with, and that's going to take some time. If at the same time we're trying to push uh, an election on the board, and at the same time we're trying to build a budget, it's all the same people. Well, there's um, another provision, which is the default budget piece. So if for some reason you weren't able to um, get your delay, uh, you, you know, in other words, you couldn't form your initial board do whatever you need to do with your articles and vote for your delay. All by July 1st. All by July 1st. Then there's a default budget that would kick in for you for for this year. For this year, even yes. though there's a delay. It, I, I, well, you wouldn't me. have the delay yet, right? If right. You've, if you voted for the delay yep. by July 1st, yep. then the default budget does not kick in. Okay. So even though we don't have a, we probably will not have a unified budget at that point. Right. If you if you vote for the delay, you don't need a unified budget. Okay. We're going to have our unified budget in the following yes. year. Well, that's that's a relief because that, that's trying to pull that all off in the same time yeah. it's just not doable. No, and, and otherwise you might as well not have this bill and just exactly. have July 1st. Exactly what I was thinking. So. Well, yeah. thank you, by the way, for your 30 years of service. I mean, I've known you in various capacities. It's um, just so you know. We didn't forget. <laughs> we know you sure. Well, I sure haven't forgot. Some of it burned into my memory. Uh, anyway, um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. I thank Senator Perschlick for being in touch with us and helping us uh, attend the, the, uh, the hearing. And I'll follow the progress of the bill. And again, okay. if we can get that kind of a delay, I think we will be able to accomplish what you want us to accomplish. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Christina Nadler. Oh, that's right. Thank you. Thank you. My mother's birthday today as well. Oh, that's nice. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we, we came down for a meeting in Bellows Falls uh, two years ago, and we tried our best to address Gomerson's issues, Vernon's issues. We were thought maybe we were creating an Act 49 a, a, a path for you guys. Um, it didn't work out for us. And for those of you yeah. who don't travel down yeah. to our little corner here, this is uh, Dumberton, the town I represent. This is our proposed 
um, supervisory district. And there's Vernon, that's that's New Hampshire, and that's Massachusetts, for those of you that don't travel down. So they're quite isolated, and they have um, withdrawn from our high school union on the basis of Act 46 so that they could keep their um, 7 through 12 choice. So that was very difficult on our SU because we have a partner. We depend on their... Uh, it was difficult on our high school union, actually, because they've been a partner, they've been contributing to our high school, and we have great concerns that there's private schools that way, there's private schools that way, there's public schools that way. For many children, it's closer, and we're very concerned it's gonna weaken the um, admission at our high school union and their tuition dollars that we were receiving before as, um, as part of our high school union. So it has been very difficult down in our corner of the woods. And I'd also like to point out that as of now, I just checked my email, we still don't know the, the long-term status of Vernon. So right now, we are not able to merge into a unified union district because we have to maintain our supervisory union district for Vernon. And Vernon contributes to our SU funds, and it still hasn't been determined what their final status is by the SU board. I'm just wondering, state because board. Huntington is in an SU with a merged unified district. Is there a provision that says you can't be a unified district if you're in an SU with Vernon? We have to maintain our supervisory union structure. Yes, to but couldn't, so couldn't you form a un unified district within that structure? Well, we can't until they figure out what, yes, we can find, we, a uni but we can't be a, a um, hold on, it's late. Uh, we can't be a single SU, one district. As, yes, yes. Um, but, so that's how, that's what they have advised right, so, for us. But the, uh, the gray, Mm -hmm. can legally and, and right now must legally merge. Yes. yes, yes. But we can't get rid of our supervisory union. The state board has not made any right. ruling that's about the, Vernon. That's the situation that Andrew Pond and Ex Exactly. Andrew so there's, it's actually a very similar situation that yeah. they've talked about either putting them with Wyndham Central, which is about a 40 minute yeah. drive away from their school to their um, SU headquarters, or merging all of our districts next year, potentially Wyndham Northeast and Wyndham Southeast into a big SU. Um, we don't know, so that's part of our problem in our corners. They have not told yeah. us what's happening. And just for a little context for people on the committee, I believe this is correct. The state board put off requests regarding SUs because they were focused on mergers and creating <coughs> unified districts. So they, they essentially um, pushed off those questions, but it seems to me that when we've addressed the situation that we have now, the SUs, um, you know, I don't know what you want to call them, the kind of vestigial SUs, so you have Huntington still roped in with the Unified District and Vernon in this case. Um, we should do a consolidation of them. Yeah, right. <laughs> the, the thing is, special ed is delivered from the SU level, so you got to have them in an SU with somebody. And transportation, I mean, and yeah. and if they move, the special education teachers get ripped throughout the whole supervisory union because they're employed at the supervisory union level. Yeah. So we will upset special education delivery relationships to our most vulnerable students. It's yeah. one of these unintended consequences with the special ed consolidation that occurred in the middle of this. I'm very concerned about that. that so so th that's definitely something we will have to look at at some point or direct the board to look at. Probably the latter, <laughs> but anyway. So I'll, I'll let you. I'm I'm Christina Naylor. I am chair of the Dumberston Town School Board. I have served on the study committee. I have served. On, I am serving on our SU board currently. Um, I also served on our alternative governance structure committee, and I am also a Wyndham Regional VSBA representative. Though I am not testifying on their behalf today, or anybody else's, just on behalf of my board. So our board and our voters have worked hard to meet the Act 46 goals alongside with our other SU partners. We've participated in over 50 study com committee meetings, drafting articles. These articles were rejected by our town. Overall, 71% of the four town district voters rejected the merger. In Dumberston, 84% of our voters rejected the merger, and their voter turnout was very high. Having this kind of failure does not help inform our process going forward, which was originally in H39, that we should know what to do. We know what not to do. Right. We know not to do that, and we That's spent a long time. The house. Exactly, so I'm arguing against that House bill. Uh, we are asking for a delay. We are, I guess, slow Band-Aid rippers. 
<laughs> Our board has applied, went back and applied a growth mindset to Act 46. We work with members from all SU boards as well as teachers and community members. It was a very open process. We met over 25 times to build the study on the study committee work and create our alternative governance proposal. Our Dumberston voters endorsed this proposal in a non-binding vote last town meeting day by a vote of approximately 200 to 1. I've included a copy of our executive summary in your packet there. Last time meeting, last week? Le no, a year ago. Okay. So. It's, it was reasonable for us to consider that this was an option for a Section 9 governance structure. We had um, heard Governor Shumlin talk on VPR's Vermont edition about how he would, I don't think you are ever to see ever in Vermont a state board saying to communities, you shall do this. But here we are. And that included a transcript. I'm a former middle school teacher, so I like handouts. So. That's that UPS. <laughs> um, so um, obviously, we invested a lot of time and effort into trying to comply with the law and finding other ways to meet the goals of the law. This was very important to us. I don't know of a school board member that I've served with anywhere in the SUA that doesn't want to do better for their children and better for their taxpayers. Not, not down in our corner, anyway. So based on this understanding of Act 46 and our voters' clear endorsement of our alternative governance structure, when the BOE ordered the forced merger of our SU, we entered into the lawsuit. We asked that the lawsuit be given time to work through the courts to assure we do not have to undo a merger. A year delay will also assure we don't have unintended consequences and that our SU has time to carefully plan for this monumental task. Experts caution against moving too quickly. Pikus, one of the authors of the Pikus Odin study, said this to the House Committee of Education in 2016. Proceed cautiously in attempting to achieve savings through consolidation because the complexities of school finance may lead to unintended consequences. It will take time. Vermont Digger reported just yesterday on the unintended consequences of rural children going hungry due to school consolidation. Months ago, I expressed this exact concern to our superintendent. This is not fake news, it's happening. A more local to Dumberston expert, Frank Rucker, who is our um, WSESU business manager and currently the president of VASBO, the Vermont Association of Business Officials, told our district that typically a year is good practice for planning to make a transition of this magnitude. We have three months. And these are not ideal circumstances. Our mergers are forced upon voters who voted against it. Our neighbor, neighboring Wyndham Central, Central districts are struggling with mergers supported by their voters, supported by transition grants, supported by generous tax incentives. They were also supported by a year of planning their implementation. Under these ideal circumstances, their taxes are increasing dramatically. And under these ideal condi conditions, our local newspaper is filled with stories of contentious school board meetings in Wyndham Central and letters from unhappy families in the initial implementation. WSSU also has the Vernon problem. Vernon has been a part of our SU and our high school union since 1956, and that has recently changed. This will if they move us around next year or the year after, this will mean we will undergo two governance changes potentially. As if, they, we, if who moves you around? If the state board decides to merge our um, Wyndham Central Supervisor, Wyndham Southeast Supervisor Union with Wyndham Northeast Supervisor Union, we will have to merge SUs after having just gone through this governance change. Yeah. So that would mean two of these transitions in two years. Although that's pretty speculative. So. They've talked about doing that. That was there. That was all of all, several, several, several state board members spoke about that. Yeah. Um, and then Daniel French said we should wait until after this portion is through yeah. to determine that, mm -hmm. to do that. Okay. Um, we also will have to figure out how to make up Vernon's assessment that, that comes through our SU as well as our, the disposition of our special education teachers. And all this is going on while we're implementing a new financial package that is not going well for our business office, apparently. So you need a delay? That's what I'm asking. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. We also need people to find, um, to run for the board. A lot of people didn't want to run for the board. It's it's a heavy lift. It's not a popular thing to work on. It's, it's a, I have kids, I have a business. 
it's being board of a chair of a small board is, is a long day for me, and this job is monumental. Um, also, we need to be thoughtful about our budgeting because Brattleboro's taxes in a combined merged district will go up, and they have the least ability to pay. We need time to not have Brattleboro taxpayers receive a tax increase that they voted against courtesy of Act 46. It feels very much like Obamacare implementation, and if we can try and find some of those savings in the, in the year to plan, yeah. I think that will help with implementation greatly. I would also like to say that there is good news happening, that Act 46 has caused us to double down on our work, and we have done a lot of things, not only in Dummerston, but throughout the district, in terms of increasing efficiency, increasing equity, and transparency and accountability. Again, I have a handout where I've listed the um, what our study committee. Can I borrow this? Yeah, sure. May I have Vanna White this for a minute? These are the primary equity, programming equity uh, initiatives that our study committee looked at. We've accomplished many of them. In fact, ones that we consider to be really important, like pre K, we have gone way beyond the goal from preferred merger. We've also started. Um, diversity training at the SU level. Our board has started broadcasting one of our monthly meetings so that we can increase transparency and accountability. And we have done the heavy lift of implementing pre-K for four-year-olds for next year. This is made even more impressive when you look at our tax rates, which I have included on table three. Um, we've kept maintained a level tax rate while we've added all these programming, and we've done this without merger. We've brought down our per-pupil costs, we've brought down our overall spending, um, by using resources efficiently, by sharing more resources within our SU, and done that while increasing programming. Uh, the House Committee on Education had testimony from our, the former board chair of Brattleboro that stated that we needed to merge immediately because um, Demerson students were not prepared for the high school. This is not factually correct. I have checked with our superintendent. There's no data to that effect. And in fact, our students score in the top five schools for middle school for the last five years. So we're getting excellent results and there's no reason to expect that our children are not prepared. Um, the, Brattleboro, the former Brattleboro chair also testified that one of our neighboring towns, Guilford, needed to immediately merge so they could get behaviorists in their classroom, um, teacher leader programs, and maintain their programming. Well, I've checked with the superintendent. They have teacher leaders. They have behaviors in the classroom right now. And they have expanded programming. And in fact, if we don't merge next year, they plan to increase their programming from the four-year-old pre-K to a three and four-year-old pre-K. So when I look at this and I, with my business background, I say, wow, we're getting excellent results down there. We're maintaining our tax rate. We are increasing programming. We're increasing equity and transparency and accountability. It's what I call a benchmarking system in the business world. Who's doing what, how are they doing it, and what are the good things they're doing? I find it hard to believe that these good things would be bad for our children to continue another year. We're not gonna stop. We're always continuing to do better for our kids. That's, all, that's what we do, that's what we're there for, to do better for our families and kids and our taxpayers. So I thank you for taking my testimony. I'm happy to answer questions, and I appreciate you squeezing me in at the end. And sorry I talked fast. Any questions for Ms. Nader? Just the question of the bill as it's drafted, have you looked at it? And I have that, glanced at it, it and I have not glanced. Your needs? So the, um, I am concerned, as um, Emily spoke about the toxicity, we have managed to stay working together and it has not been pretty and the public has, you know, situations of the public have not all been pretty, but whatever side, I talk to everybody whether they agree with me or not and most of us have maintained that. I'm concerned with the small schools grant that that would be really difficult. I mean, I understand the motivation behind doing it. I'm just concerned that it's just one more bit of toxicity for our district as well as others. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, the, the idea behind this was to say um, you can get a delay. So communities, the gray communities, many of them want a delay yes. very badly. So you can get it by electing this um, initial board. So I think it changes the equation in a way. Before it was, you have to elect initial, an initial board, and then you're gonna you know, be herded along to make a July 1st deadline. Now you can say to people in the community, 
who, who want to merge, we're forming our initial board. For people who don't want to merge, you could say, uh, we're forming our initial board, that's how we get your delay. Yeah. So I, I think there will be less toxicity around this approach than people are making out because in effect, it aligns for that vote, it, not perfectly, but it has people moving in the same direction for different reasons. I'm, so A, I should say I'm not speaking on behalf of my board because we did not yep. see this event last night and I was authorized to say this, so yep. I'm speaking, and I haven't even read it nor have I um, consulted legal counsel or the superintendent. My concern is the toxicity of the small schools grant because two schools get small schools grants. Not, the, not so much the transitional board issue, but that the push to do it very quickly in order I to get that small school grant. Would incentivize them to vote for 2019. Right. Well, and, and, and that might be a good thing, but then is that really a good thing well, for well, the schools? I, I understand children? what you're saying, which is it, it gives the side that doesn't want to delay an argument. Um, and, and without it, it's clear that everybody would want to delay. But right. from our point of view, we're trying to make sure that communities do have an argument to move forward. So we, we have you know a couple that we're watching that are that are very close. And the last thing we want to happen is to have people say, okay, there's nothing to be gained. Now we might as well drop our tools for a year and then pick it up again. So the small school grant is on the one hand meant to provide just a, a small impetus, but on the other hand, it's an issue that has to be dealt with anyway because the state board threw it back to us um, for us to, to take some sort of position on. But I, I hear you, any, I think it's fair to say, any change you make to the chess board now produces complexities. Yes. And in, in the largest sense, we're trying to get you the time where those complexities are not um, you know, gonna kill anybody, they're, they're gonna be smoothed out by the fact that there's an addition. I think that's the most important thing, and if it could be a clean additional year that we're just working, and there's not something we have to argue about ad nauseum with various legal counsel, it would yeah. be refreshing for the hardworking yeah. board members. I think I can say that on their behalf. Right. They would just like something clean that we don't have to call six lawyers to yeah. understand what the implications are, and anything that reduces the volume on, on the various sides would be very helpful. And yeah. some of the things in the bill I believe could, but it, the, especially the small schools grant where do it now, throw your budget under the bus. Well, and, and just to clarify something we clarified before, but maybe even here. So if you take the delay, it's not that you don't get the small schools grants. It's that you have to go through that, that process. So right. you're not, it's not that you're getting money you wouldn't have, it's that you're getting it easier right. if you but you may lose it. You if, might you might lose it if your analysis of your excellence in teaching went down. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate thank it. You. It's a long thank drive that you made. Thank you very uh, much. So, uh, Susan, how how long will it take you to do? Your oh, I can beat you in five minutes. Okay. So, um, please mm -hmm. join us. So, Susan is the last witness we have. I had hoped that maybe we could, Andrew has some ideas he wanted to put out. Um, I had hoped we could get to those by 4.30 because I have a meeting. Um, it's, I, I don't have one of the things that I might need for that, so it might be better to okay. do it tomorrow. Yeah, we'll do it tomorrow. Okay. okay. So with Susan, we're talking now about the, the so-called ADIC language and the piece of the miscellaneous bill about how to deal with the prospect of colleges closing unexpectedly. Susan Stightley with the Association of Vermont Independent Colleges. Um, I just want to quickly remind you, I know you all know that higher education is the third or fourth largest industry in the state. We are you know, suffering right now. We still have over 16,000 students, even with the colleges that are going to close, over 4,000 employees and staff, and 1.1 billion in direct expenses. Granted, the, the communities that are, that are going to see these colleges close are really going to feel a lot of pain. Um, and so I think our conversation should be more about how we can work together rather than overburdening um, the, the colleges. And this new language, uh, which we're not in favor of, um, I think we, we already have several 
triggers here that the agency of education or the state board can you know go to court. Uh, they could also, in a case of Burlington College, they could have gone to the insurance company and director and officer a liability to pursue an action there. So, so just for clarity, when you say you're not in favor of the new language, it's yours in part. <laughs> I would have to say it's become <laughs> your language. Okay, but, but what I mean is you gave us what I'll call new stipend language, and we had old yes. stipend language. Yes, yeah. So they were, they were both of your authorship. Are you objecting to the new piece, or are you objecting to the fact that it's been paired now with the old piece? I'm objecting. We're fine with the, the new language that we presented uh, that went in the institution. We agree. We're fine with what the agency has requested that, um, you know, in five business days, once they go on probation, not necessarily financial probation, they have to notify the agency, and that in 60 days, they have to submit a student record plan. So we think that is sufficient. Uh, and that the previous language is no longer necessary. And particularly now, as it's been rewritten, uh, requiring us to be responsible for members who were members within the last two years. So for example, in the last three years, Green Mountain College has only been a member of AVIC for six months. So this makes us liable for somebody who just, you know, was only a member in the last, for six months of the last three years. So. Um, we, we don't think that is equitable, and we think that there's enough safeguards already with requiring the institutions to come forward and with the legal uh, resources that are there. Okay, so let me just ask the operative question. So you're saying that, so new and old, you're, you're saying that you're okay with the new language and you think that it's sufficient and that it will provide enough safeguards. Yes. So if that's the case, then the old language which binds AVIC by a memorandum of understanding would never be triggered. We actually had asked that that language be struck. I understand yeah. that. Yes. But, but in other words, what I'm saying is, but, your argument to us is take away the old language, the, the new will never impact the state because it's sufficient. Yes. And, and, and so what I'm the, saying is if that's true, then that old language will never be triggered, right? Right. That's, yeah. Okay, that's so there's no reason really to get rid of the old language. <laughs> Well, it does, you know, it's still there, it's still there, so you never know what's going to happen. Well, and, you never know what's going to happen. I don't want it to happen to the state. But again, you know, this is, <laughs> we had one outlier. This has happened the first time in history. So, you know, you're putting additional safeguards for one unique outlier situation that is highly unlikely to uh, happen again. AVIC in the last year has done a lot of due diligence. I handed out our records policy. So we adopted and voted on that so that we're trying to get everybody in line with the records so that they can easily be transferable. So I think we've done our due diligence on this. I do question whether legally you can require us members who have no obligation to each other to contract in this way um, it, before we agree to it, yeah. now we, we wouldn't agree to it. So say you had a farmer's association and a farmer had an environmental violation and couldn't fix it or pay for it. Would you require all the farmers in that association to come forward? Well, if, if we had this legislation in place for them where they were required to create a common memorandum of understanding. So as I see it, it's, it's asking the organization to cover for its members in the case that one of them goes down. So they're, they're in, a, in a sense, insuring the state against, and you remember the context, which was to avoid having to take out bonds, financial bonds. Yes, yeah. So rather than go down that road again of requiring your members to have $50,000 bonds, we could do that. That language still exists, but it was problematic your people really didn't want it. It would probably put two or three new colleges out of business. Yeah. So what I'm what I'm feeling is that with three different colleges in the news about possibilities of closure, I I would rather go with more safeguards rather than less. So I understand the house I believe is doing what you want in terms of just the new language. For my own, and I'll speak for myself, we haven't voted on it yet. I would prefer that we move the, uh, the, the pieces together. We'll wind up in a conference with the House, and it may be that they can be persuasive about uh, a different way to do it, or, um, but you know, I know when I 
turn on the radio or pick up Vermont Digger or whatever it is, and there's another college looking at closing, I immediately feel like I should have done more. So I like the idea of adding your new language to what we have, and if you're right that it will never be triggered, the old language, then nobody's the worse off. Court. So quick question, you just said to have a bond, like a surety bond that would put a couple colleges out of business. I mean, in most, I've already talked about what I do for a living out here, we sell surety bonds. Most gas stations have a tax bond that costs like 500 bucks a year, a $50,000 surety bond. To cover that would be like a thousand bucks, maybe. So my understanding, and I have right. very little knowledge of it, is that it's based on your financial circumstances. So if a college is in financial trouble, they're gonna have a higher bond. Where like Norwich University will be paying nothing. Right, but fifty thousand dollars is not. You'd never pay more than fifty thousand dollars. You'd pay a very small percentage of that. But it's based on their financial stability. So correct. Okay. And so we, it, you know, we went around and around for a couple yeah. of weeks. Who would offer them? What would people have to pay? Dot dot dot. And Susan suggested now the old stipend language, which we went with. Um, <laughs> So I I I understand uh, your your objections and and your preference that we swap out the new with the old and I we will put that to a vote and um, you know I think that miscellaneous bill is just about ready. What we haven't done is vote on that concept. So we'll be doing that um, probably Friday. So if you'd like to come in Friday um, for that discussion. Okay, it. I would just you know really say the original stately language is much more acceptable than the new Barbaroth language, which yeah, includes yeah, people who aren't members. Which was offered entirely by people. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have the two years? Uh, no, no, no that, that's, that's, that's the part. Yeah, that's the only. Yeah. That's the only. Well, thank you. Thank you.